Did you say happy Easter to somebody next to you already? Um, I, w- I want you to tell somebody next to you that you look good, right? You look like Easter ready. You look Easter good, right? Um, sometimes we dress up, right, for, for church, even more so uh, for Easter. Um, but I have a question. I have a question for you. I have a question. Um, why did you come to church today? And I'm not asking for any out loud answers. just want you to listen. Right? Why did you come to church today? Um, obviously, it's Easter. Uh, but what are you hoping for? What are, you, what are you hoping for? And what do you want God to do in your life? What do you need from God? I just want to start with asking that question. Because obviously, there's the formality of Easter, and we were invited, and we're here to support. Um, and if we're honest, though, some of us felt a little obligated, right? Maybe you're younger, and you're still in your parents' house. And you're like, oh, they're good. they dragged me here. A little obligated. Um, uh, maybe you feel like I have to because it's Easter, because Jesus did a lot, and, and this is the day to come. Maybe you're not a church person, right? And again, you were invited. You're supporting. We're so glad you're here. You came with your family. Um, it's tradition. Uh, I wanted to dress up. We're going we're gonna to eat afterwards and they promise me a big meal, you know, whatever, whatever that is. Um, there's different reasons why we come to church. Um, but, but my question is, why did you come? And, and what are you hoping for? And, and what do you want God to do? Because the reality is, um, we all look good on the outside. You just told the person next to you. Did you tell the other choice that they look good too? Because sometimes we only say one. We, don't, we didn't look to the other side. Um, we all look good on the outside, but for many of us, and if you're like me, if you're human, um, there may be some areas of your life where you're hurting a little bit, where you're going through some, through some drama, maybe some loss. Uh, maybe today there's some guilt in your heart. Maybe there's some shame. Uh, maybe you feel, even though you're here with everybody, you still feel alone. Maybe there's anxiety. Maybe there is issues going on in, in the marriage. Maybe you have a health condition. Maybe there's financial issues. And there's all these different reasons that we uh, may be um, broken on the inside, right? And even though we look good on the outside, And so I want to just start by saying no matter why you came to church today, that Jesus has a promise that speaks directly to you, and especially if you have some some kind of pain. Um, This series that we're starting today is going to be amazing. We're going to talk about promises that Jesus uh, left us with, and how many thank God for his promises. Um, We're going to talk about next week, Jesus promises that you will know his voice, we're going to go on. We'll take a week off when we do our, our church connect, but we'll come back and go to John. Jesus promises to be with you always, that Jesus promises to be with you always. He promises to give you peace. He promises that you don't have to worry. How many are, are worries, worriers? Like I had this nightmare that the internet went down before I got to church. And it's like, you know, it was crazy, but it didn't. And God is good. <laughs> We would have started at church anyway. Uh, but Jesus promises you also to give you rest. And these are things that we're going to talk about. Today, um, we're going pro- to talk about how Jesus promised that, he, promised that he loves you and he loves you. He loves you. And, we're, and we're not st- I'm going to start with the, one of the most famous scriptures in all of the Bible. In fact, you see Tim Tebow with this on sometimes under his eyes. He, he wears that. How many remember that? Uh, John 3.16, we could probably all quote it by memory, but let's, let's read this together. Um, it says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his what? His one and only son that Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. This is the most important scripture in, in all of the Bible, I believe. And how many believe that God loves the world? How many believe that he loves everybody, right? He loves everybody. We're, we're not here to judge anybody, to judge any lifestyle, to judge any, any choices, to judge any addictions. To ju- we're here to say that, that God loves you. We love you. Right? But the problem, if you're like me, um, I've always believed that God loves the world, but sometimes I have a hard time believing that he loves me. Has anybody ever been there? Because you know you. I know me. Like, I know what goes on up in this bald head of mine, right? 
I, I know the craziness, the thoughts that can go through my mind, the, the anger, the, the, the anxiety, the different things that I deal with. And sometimes I don't feel like God, I'm worthy that, that God would love me. And, and the reality is, I think we all go through this. But I love um, what St. Augustine said. He said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. And that is my heart today. That is my goal today, that you would leave here knowing that you're not a number, that you're not just another person, that you're not just an accident, but that you are loved by God. You as an individual. And I want to show you today that you are the one that Jesus loves. In Luke chapter 15, verse 5, Scripture says this, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Will he leave the 99 others in the wilderness and go search for the one that is lost until he finds it? Right? This is this, this parable that, that Jesus is giving. And, and, and here's, here, here's what Jesus does when he finds the one, when he finds the one, and that's us today. He, he puts that one on his shoulders there's this painting that is famous for Jesus putting the lamb on his shoulders, the lost sheep, rather. And I want you to know today, above anything else, that however you're feeling, whatever you're dealing with, whether you feel worthy or not, that that's you right there. That if you feel lost, that Jesus will find you. That Jesus loves you. That Jesus will carry you. In Luke chapter 5, 15, verse 7, moving on, it says, that in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over what? One, right? Over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. This means that if you are straying, right? If you are feeling alone, if you are feeling that God doesn't love, like you're actually a highlight to him that you actually in a, in a good place, that God loves, 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 loves you. He loves you. And D Jesus, he didn't just promise to love us. He proved his love. In, in 1 John 4, 8, it said, God, it says, God is love. This is how he showed his love among us. He sent his who? his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I'm so grateful that, that God did this. And I heard something, somebody say recently that Jesus died for a maybe. And, and, and what he meant by that and, and, and what 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 that means is you may or may not love him back. You may or may not receive him. You have a choice, but he still came to die for us that in hopes that you will choose him. And I don't know about you, but that does something to me when I hear, when I heard it's phrased that way, that Jesus died for a maybe. Jesus died in case I would be uh, humble enough to come to his feet and accept him. And that says something about our Savior, that he took a risk on the whole world, that he took a risk on everyone. And that, that love isn't just what God does, but love is who he is. It's who he is. This is a powerful verse. And it's, it's, it's way more, I want to read you a verse that's incredibly powerful, but even more powerful when you know who wrote it. In the book of 1 John, um, does anybody know who wrote John? It's not, it's not a trick question. It's John, right? I know you knew. I knew you knew it. I knew you knew it. You just didn't want to be the first one to be like, just in case it's not John. I don't want to say it, right? Just in case. But John wrote John. And how many remember, how many guys are here, you remember having nicknames for your friends uh, growing up? Like you just, they weren't your friend unless you just had a nickname for them. They weren't just Robert or Steve. They were like Bo and Bubba and, you know, whatever. Like they were, you know, like Bethel calls me Jojo. It's not Joe. Like there's just, you, you have names for the people that are close to you, especially guys. We did that a lot growing up. 
And Jesus, um, he gave nicknames to those who were closest to him too. In fact, uh, John and James, they were these two hotheads that when they came to know Christ and they came to start following him, they were... um, they, 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 were a little, they were a little fiery, right? How many are a little fiery when stuff happens, right? You're just like, you know, who's in my front yard? You know, the who's, who's whatever. Like, we get a little crazy, right? And, and Jesus actually um, called uh, uh, Peter, if you remember, he called him the rock, right? So that was way before Dwayne Johnson. Like, we, he, that, this is not new thing. This isn't new. Um, and then we had James and John again. Um, they weren't too gentle people. They were like Bible bros, right? They were like, yeah, we, this is what we do. And he called them the sons of thunder. Can you imagine that being your nickname? Like you're like, I'm going to start calling my kids that because they just make craziness in the house. Anybody, can anybody have a name, shout an amen for that, right? Or when your kids were younger, you remember, right? Is there get a little crazy. Um, But why the sons of thunder? Um, There's a glimpse of this in in Luke chapter 9. Luke tells us that um, there was a Samaritan village that was rejecting Jesus. They were going to this village and they're like, you're not allowed here. Luke chapter 9 verse 54 says, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? And destroy them. (laughs) So here they are going to preach about peace and about love. And they're like, you don't belong here. They're like, do you want us to kill them? I mean, because you kind of gave us some, like, right? Like, really? Like, this is the kind of people they were. But but listen, their whole lives, they were like this. How many just have that in them, right? Right? Their whole lives, they were like this. And, and James and John, I would imagine, they were like the dads that would be kicked out of the basket, their kid's basketball game or, or their kid's soccer game because they were just so mad at the refs for making bad calls, right? They, they, they were that dad. Anybody, anybody, is anybody that dad in here? All right, there's a few of you. There's a few of you. Um, they didn't wear, they didn't go wear Lululemon and eat, you know, uh, avocado toast together. They were like men's men, okay? I'm telling you right now, they, they were, they were this, these guys. And then here's, here's the deal though. Then John, he, he spent more time w- with Jesus. And every moment and every day and all the time that passed that he spent with Jesus, he began to change. He began to change. And isn't it true that the longer and the closer we get to Christ, we start to see things a little bit different. Maybe we have more patience. Maybe we have more faith, right? Just, just ask grandma who's been in church all her life. Something happens, it's going to be all right. You're like, how can you be so at peace? Because she's been there. She's been there. It's going to be okay. How? I don't know, but it is, right? Because She's been there. He's been there. They've been there. And they have seen God prove himself over and over and over again. And as John spent more time with Jesus, and we don't exactly know when, but his identity started to change. And him being the author of John, he started to refer to himself as the one that Jesus loved the one that Jesus loved. Not, no longer the thun, sons of thunder, no longer the hothead, no longer the screw up, no longer the, I, I, I have all the wrong answers and all the, you know, it, it's the one that Jesus loved. And, and I want to ask you that question again. Why did you come to church today? And what are you hoping for? And what do you want God to do? What do you need? And my heart feels like somebody needs to hear that you're the one that Jesus loves. You're the one that Jesus loves. No matter what your parents told you growing up, no matter how somebody made you feel, no matter how many times you failed, no matter how many thoughts you had that were just really dark, no matter who hurt you, no matter what somebody said, 
no matter what you did, you are the one that Jesus loves. And I want you to just say softly, right where you're at, I'm the one that Jesus loves. Did you just say that a couple times to yourself? I'm the one that Jesus loves. See, for me, um, I've always believed, ever since I grew up in the church, my dad was radically saved and delivered from alcohol when I was 11 years old. And, and God later called me uh, to be a pastor about 20 years ago. We started this place. There's a few of you that, are, that started, that have been, we've been together this entire time. And I remember early on in the ministry, I went to, um, to school to learn more. It was called the Mile High School of Ministry. And I, I was like, oh, I, gotta, I wanna learn theology and I wanna learn you know, how to be a better preacher and pastor and care for people. Because my, my style of, of counseling is um, when somebody comes up to me and they say, hey, I've got issues and I can't stop getting mad, I'll just show them a calendar and I'll say, pick a date, and on that date, just stop. Like, I didn't know how to, like, counsel. I'm like, just, just stop. Like, just stop. All right. And I wanted to get better, and, we were, and I was learning theology, and, and one, of the, one of the professors um, took me to lunch one time, and, and we were talking, and, you know, and all oh, the riches of glory and, and the depth of God's love. And I remember being at a stop sign. It was like 104th and I-25. We were at a stoplight. And he says, he looks at me, and he goes, you know, Jesus loves you too, right? And I broke. Because I, 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 I've always been convinced that he loves everybody. And there's nothing that you can do to make God not love you. But there was something in me that just, resisted God loving me, like me, are you sure, me? And, and I broke and, and, I, and I, tears started coming out of my eyes because it was the first time that it was personalized for me. And I know that sounds weird. I was already pastoring and I was already leading and preaching, and, 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 but it was the first time where I felt like I opened the, my own heart up to say, okay, God, I'm gonna let you love me because up until now, I've been just trying. I've been trying to work for people. I've been trying to please you. I've been trying to please my parents. I've been trying to, to, to build your church and not letting you just love me for me. And, and I'm convinced that if you have ever met God and maybe you've strayed or maybe you feel distant, maybe you, whatever, whatever that looks like for you, I'm convinced that if you just allow God to love you because you're going to mess up. How many mess up? Every hand better. If you just allow God to love you, the devil will never take you out of the game. Are you hear, are you hear what I'm saying? If I let my mistakes and, and my, my shortcomings and, and, and my struggles keep me from feeling God's love and keep me from, from I, we would not be here for 20 years. And I, don't, I say that humbly. I say that I have to every day receive God's love and I say, God, I know you love me and I know you still want me to serve a church. I, I know you still want me to prepare a message. I know you still want me to baptize and dedicate and, and do everything despite my own struggles and mistakes and things that I go through. And, and, I'm, and I'm telling you today, that if there was any, and I hate to even say secret, but if the, the Holy Spirit and God's power is a secret, but if there was anything that you needed to do on your side to stay serving God, to stay is accept his love and the fact that no matter what you do, no matter how far you are today, no matter what you're doing, whatever is happening, if you would accept that today and you would say, God loves me and remind yourself of that every day, you're going to stay in it for the long haul. And you'll find yourself drifting less and less. It, it, it's, it's so important and it's so simple. But he loves. He, he loves you. And here we are on Easter. 
reminding ourselves and being reminded and celebrating that God didn't just shout down his love from heaven, but he showed us. In Romans 5, 8, scripture says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still what? How many, how many sin? Christ died for us on a maybe, on a chance that you would accept him, on a chance that he gave you. He doesn't force you to love him. But he does give you purpose. He does give you peace. He does give you freedom. He does give you a meaning for life. You don't have to go searching around for what meaning, what meaning, uh, the, what the meaning of life is. You don't have to go to social media. You don't have to go for whatever is popular. You don't have to go for whatever the, the world is saying you should or shouldn't or try. God has the answer. He made you perfect. And, and Jesus, when he was on this earth, he would heal the sick and, and he, he was friends with prostitutes and he loved the lepers. And he was willing to walk into the hands of his betrayers and then suffered this emotional night before he was going to be crucified in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he didn't resist arrest when they came to get him. He didn't defend himself. He went on trial and he was willing to subject himself to this physical and this emotional pain that he was going through. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They pressed it up against his head. His face was so disfigured. According to the book of Isaiah, it said they're so disfigured. He didn't even look human. The Roman soldiers drove stakes through his wrists and his ankles and Jesus hang, hung naked on a cross for hours in the heat of the day, this excruciating pain. Muscle cramps, dehydration, shock, slowly suffocating, struggling to breathe as they cursed him. And even in all that, he said, Father, what did he say? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Art is never afraid to get the answer. He knows, he knows. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So Jesus was on a cross thinking about you, thinking about me, thinking about the world, when he said, It is finished, and into your hands I commit my spirit. And the earth shook. But three days later, some women went to visit the tomb. The, stole, the stone was rolled away, right? And Jesus was no longer there. He was no longer there. He came back to life. Can we give God some glory this morning for that? He came back to life. And, and maybe, maybe you're desperate. Again, you're hurting, you're alone, you're afraid, you have doubts, you have questions, you're ashamed, you're on, you feel unworthy. God loves you. God loves you. You were the one Jesus was thinking of. You were the one that he loves. And this is the day that we celebrate that changed everything because he came back to life. And because he lives, we can live. Because he rose again, we can have salvation. Because he is alive, those who saw him spread the good news they even gave their life. No, I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who would die for, for a lie. It was not a lie. He came back to life. And here we are today, over 2,000 years later, the good news still spreading across the world. I want you to feel his love today.